Hi, my name is Crystal Dahl, and I'm the Online Communications Specialist at Meritas Headquarters. I would like to welcome and thank each of you for joining today's Capability Webinar, an overview of oil and gas drilling and production. Today's webinar is scheduled for 60 minutes. Joining us as our presenters are David Pardue, lead of Andrews Davis' Oil and Gas Department, together with Randy Smith and Rhonda McLean, also oil and gas lawyers at Meritas' Oklahoma City affiliate, Andrews Davis. Before we get started, I would like to walk through a few housekeeping items. As you may have already noticed, your phone line is muted. If you have questions today for David, Randy, or Rhonda, I encourage you to send a message through the chat feature located in the lower, lower left-hand corner of your screen. Questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. If you are experiencing technical difficulties, please press star zero on your phone line and someone will join the line to assist you. If you are having trouble hearing the presenters, you may also send a chat message and they will make an effort to speak up. With that, David, are you ready to get started? I am. Wonderful. Hi, I'm David Pardue and I'm here with uh, Randy Smith and Rhonda McLean. Um, we practice uh, oil and gas law uh, in Oklahoma City. Um, this is a general, uh, a very general overview, start to finish um, of oil and gas uh, drilling and production. There'll be some title issues and uh, litigation issues and uh, just a general statement of uh, what oil and gas is all about. There will also be, I just wanted to remind you that uh, in Fort Worth, September 26th and September 27th, there will be an oil and gas uh, uh, presentation by uh, Meritas, and there will be a lot more detail available to, uh, to us all at that time. Uh, in July of 2008, uh, the price of oil was $147 a barrel. Uh, by December of 2008, the price of oil had dropped to $32 a barrel. Uh, you might remember that uh, uh, our global recession uh, hit in uh, July and August of 2008. And by the way, gas was $13 in MCF in July, and it had dropped to $1.40 uh, by the time oil dropped to $32 a barrel. This was a precipitous decline in this uh, in, this, uh, in these minerals and in these values. And uh, uh, right now, uh, today, the price of oil is $107 a barrel and gas is $375 uh, an MCF. Uh, and it has been uh, around $100 a barrel uh, for at least the past, uh, oh, I'm gonna say uh, 12 months. And that's a real easy, uh, uh, value for producers of oil and gas to meet their uh, lifting costs and make a healthy profit. Now, uh, the reason why oil and gas has gotten such uh, attention lately is that, uh, is that uh, we do have that real good price of oil. Gas is still uh, way low, and there are uh, three uh, real good reasons for that. One, is the discovery uh, of uh, shale gas. Two is the ability to reach shale gas through horizontal wells. And three is the ability to uh, uh, extract that uh, gas through fracking. Uh, and so now we have this huge, uh, some call it uh, overabundant supply of gas, and that's kept the price of gas down. But those three same three things, uh, shale, which is a real hard, uh, I'll call it rock, as opposed to sand, which is what used to be the uh, horizon that you produce oil and gas from, and horizontal wells, which are, uh, which is drilling sideways instead of vertically uh, up to two miles, and then fracking those things open to increase the uh, permeability and the, uh, uh, so that you can get the uh, product to the surface uh, have, uh, uh, enabled uh, the United States and, and other countries to uh, have uh, uh, whole new uh, opportunities to uh, exploit uh, what used to be uh, uh, foreign dependence on uh, oil and gas. Uh, 
Canada was uh, a biggest uh, a big supplier. Mexico is a big supplier, and the Middle East was a big supplier. And now they're predicting the United States is going to lose its uh, uh, energy uh, uh, dependence uh, in the relatively uh, near future. Uh, as a matter of fact, now the United States is a net gas, natural refined gas exporter. So we we refine gas and actually sell it abroad. Um, let's, uh, that's just a real general uh, beginning statement. We've got about 17 slides uh, or so that are uh, generic or general topics. And so let's go to uh, our next slide, which we're calling the way in. And uh, so what we're doing is, is we're talking about, well, what do you, how do you get started in the oil and gas business and uh, if you can see that slide, the, the first way in is, is you buy these minerals. And what we're talking about there when we say minerals, we're talking about uh, oil and gas. Uh, that's all we're talking about when we say minerals. Um, so who owns these uh, minerals, this oil and gas? Well, they're, uh, they're people who uh, uh, are oftentimes originally uh, agricultural owners. They're farmers, and when they bought their uh, land or when they inherited the land, it came with the minerals. A lot of times those minerals got severed from the surface. So what happens is, is that the guy that's interested, the company that's interested in uh, getting into the oil and gas business, the first thing he needs to do is, is he needs to acquire an interest in those Uh, outright uh, from, we'll say, Farmer Jones, uh, or uh, he can, he or she can uh, lease uh, the exclusive right to drill for and produce uh, oil and gas. Uh, and a lot of times, uh, landmen will uh, team up with geologists who who uh, will decide that this looks like a real good area to. Uh, drill into this, uh, what looks to be a producing formation, and, uh, and the, the geologist together with the landman and the oil company uh, will make that decision. And they'll send that landman out there, and uh, he'll uh, offer uh, to uh, lease the uh, minerals from the mineral owner, and they'll sign a lease. And we'll get back into these oil and gas leases uh, in, in just a minute, but we now have the, uh, an oil and gas lease. And, and now we're on the next uh, slide, which says take an assignment of the lease. And what happens so often is, is that the landman will get the lease, um, and he will sell it by making an assignment of that lease to an oil company, or the oil company will have its own land department. And what they do is, is that uh, they'll uh, want to partner up with other folks um, uh, in the business because they don't want to spend uh, all that much money drilling it. They may want to retain a majority interest, and so they'll issue assignments of the leases to other people who want to participate in it. Uh, moving quickly on, because we've got so much to cover, we've got uh, our next slide is entitled Players. So we've got an operator, and we're, we've been calling him the oil company, and he's going to actually operate the well uh, pursuant to a contract that he has with his uh, uh, partners. Now, they don't want to be called partners because laws uh, um, expose oil and gas partners to uh, extended liability. So the joint operating agreement that we'll talk about here in a minute um, governs this relationship between the operator and his uh what we'll call non-operating working interest owners. We also have the surface owner who may or, not, may or may not own the minerals, and we'll get into what uh, gets involved with uh, surface owners, but that's where the pad is going to go, which is what you call where the, the drill site location is. We've talked a little bit about the mineral owner and the royalty owner, and the working interest owner you'll see is the guy that has an interest, other, <coughs> an interest in the oil and gas lease. Uh, the next slide has players continued, and now we have uh, an overriding royalty interest owner. Now, this guy 
is somebody that uh, maybe he's a geologist and he developed this uh, geological prospect and sold it to the uh, an oil company who is now the operator. And the oil company says, I'll tell you what, I'll give you an override on every barrel or MCF of, of gas that is produced from this in exchange for uh, your uh, prospect that you've uh, sold us. Uh, the overriding royalty interest owner has a good deal because he doesn't have to worry about paying for any of the costs. Uh, he basically has the same deal that the royalty owner has, which is essentially, and I'm going to oversimplify this a little bit, he gets his oil and gas pretty much free in cost of uh, the expenses of drilling and development. He has to pay some costs of marketing, and he has to pay his uh, taxes that uh, uh, in Oklahoma are called gross production taxes. We've got the drilling rig owner, which may or may not be the operator. A lot of times uh, drilling uh, operators will hire uh, rig companies to drill the uh, well for them, and we'll talk about the contracts that are entered into between the operator and the drilling rig owner. We've talked about the landman. He's the one, as I said, that goes out and uh, knocks on the farmer's door uh, and says, hey, you've got some minerals we'd like to lease, and he assembles all of those leases. Uh, and we've talked about the geologist who's the one that uh, discovered the presence of uh, oil and gas in producing quantities. The engineer is uh, the guy that's going to design uh, the, uh, the drilling of the uh, well into the producing horizon. And then he also is going to be involved in uh, uh, secondary recovery operations. Sometimes uh, 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 engineers get contracted out by operators. There are engineers who are drilling consultants, and they basically take over the entire drilling operations. Like uh, ExxonMobil will oftentimes uh, just use uh, drilling consultants rather than have it done uh, in-house. Those are some of the players. Some more players are the pumper. He's a guy that's in the pickup truck that drives from location to location and checks up on the equipment, makes sure it's pumping, uh, making sure there's no leaks, making sure there's no uh, uh, waste. Uh, Making he he does what they call gauge reports to tell uh, the uh, operator uh, what's going on uh, every time he goes out on location. We've got uh, opinion lawyers that we're going to get back into that write title opinions. Rhonda McLean is going to talk about that because she's a title opinion lawyer. Regulatory lawyers, uh, you have to deal with your state. Uh, they the state has. Uh, uh, pretty extensive police powers over pooling and spacing. Randy's going to talk about that. I know I'm talking fast, but we do have a lot to cover. We have purchases of production that is different from uh, anybody we've talked about so far. Once you get the oil or gas uh, to the surface, you're going to sell it, and you're going to enter into a division order contract with that purchaser of production uh, who will be buying it and maybe even selling it on to a refiner. The division order analyst is somebody that uh, is also going to be uh, most likely a title opinion lawyer, and that person is going to uh, determine uh, exactly what the percentage ownership is of all these people who have uh, assignments of oil and gas leases, uh, all the uh, uh, overriding royalty interest owners who are smart enough to record their overrides, and all the royalty owners. Uh, Rhonda is also a division order title opinion lawyer, and she can talk a little bit more about that. Now, um, we've got contracts, lots and lots of contracts. Now, a lot of these contracts uh, are done in the oil and gas business without lawyers uh, in the day-to-day -day, uh, practice of it. Uh, you can see up there at the beginning of uh, what I'm looking at is slide 7. Uh, says surface damage agreements. Uh, Randy's going to talk about surface damage agreements. Uh, the next one is the oil and gas lease, which is a contract, very, very important contract. We're going to strongly recommend that uh, if uh, a mineral owner comes to you and says that a landman has proposed signing an oil and gas lease, that uh, that oil and gas lease be uh, modified uh, to fit the needs of the, the mineral owner. Uh, real important contract. They've gotten 
much more complicated uh, in, even in the last few years. Assignment really just, we're talking about an assignment of an oil and gas lease. Uh, that's also a very important document. Oil and gas leases are typically not drawn up by lawyers. Uh, assignments are typically not drawn up by lawyers. Uh, the joint operating agreement is uh, uh, also known in the industry as a JOA. Uh, the joint operating agreements uh, are not litigated very often because they are so well done and they're so detailed. Uh, but a joint operating agreement, the parties to that are the operator and each of the uh, working interest owners who took an assignment of the oil and gas lease is part of an investment that they're making uh, in exchange for the amount of money that they're going to pay as their pro rata share of the cost of uh, drilling and developing the well. The JOA is a very important document uh, and, and there are many provisions of, in it that can be uh, negotiated and uh, they need to be studied. Every single aspect of, uh, of uh, drilling and development, uh, reworking, recompletion, plugging and abandonment are covered in a joint operating agreement. Uh, the lease is, is attached as uh, an exhibit to a JOA and each of the working interest owners are uh, listed and sign off on the JOA. Ron is going to talk a little bit more later about JOAs and whether or not they should be recorded with the land records of the county clerk of the county where the well is located. Now we've got, a, we've got even more contracts briefly uh, on the next slide. We've got a drilling contract and again this is not one that's typically negotiated uh, with the help of lawyers. These are uh, well-known form contracts between the drilling contractor and the operator, just those two parties. We've got saltwater disposal agreements. Those things are getting much more important because it takes so much water to drill horizontal wells. Uh, Randy's going to uh, talk a lot more about uh, saltwater disposal agreements. Uh, saltwater disposal agreement, the parties of those are usually the surface owner uh, and uh, the uh, operator of the well. Uh, purchasing contracts are contracts uh, between the purchaser of oil and gas and usually the operator, although working interest owners do have the right to enter into their own uh, purchasing agreements, and those things are called uh, split stream contracts. Uh, we probably won't have time to talk much about that, uh, and maybe we can get into that more uh, in the seminar the last of September in Fort Worth. Investor participation agreements uh, can be entered into uh, by people who are not going to be assigned uh, working interests in the leases but can be uh, investing in uh, larger oil and gas uh, um, prospectuses. Uh, these are uh, uh, securities uh, uh, more often than not and uh, as we saw in the early 80s and uh, later on, there have been a lot of securities uh, litigation uh, involving uh, uh, what constitutes a security in the oil and gas business. Division orders uh, tell the uh, purchaser of production who to pay to the eighth decimal. Uh, they're done in conjunction with the division order title lawyer, and Ron is going to talk a lot more about that. Um, I'm on timeline, which I have as slide nine uh, moving through this. Uh, and Randy, uh, what we've got in here is uh, four items. Uh, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about uh, uh, these items? And, and Rhonda, uh, I want you also to. Well, the first thing we have is basically whenever oil and gas leases have been taken and an oil company has decided to drill a well, and they're ready to basically move a drilling rig onto the surface, drill the well, and produce the well, you have to have an agreement with the landowner. And David mentioned earlier that a lot of times the landowner may or may not have mineral underneath his, his surface property. And in Oklahoma, and I think pretty universally, um, the surface is, is the subservient estate to the mineral interest, which basically means that um, 
if, if an oil and gas well needs to be drilled, the surface owner is basically going to have to deal with some of the state powers that allow oil companies to go ahead and drill the well. Now, ideally, the oil companies would come out there, negotiate an agreement with the surface owner for payment of damages, payment for use, they pay for easements, they pay for pipelines, they pay for all those things. But in Oklahoma, um, it's a little bit different because if no agreement can be reached, basically what happens is there's an act in our statute, it's called the Surface Damage Act. And this act basically allows the oil companies or whoever wants to drill the well to go on the property, sue, or to, I'm sorry, to sue first, then go onto the property and drill the well. You know, and litigation happens after that to determine the, a reasonable price for the surface owner to be paid. And so that's basically how an oil company can enter the property. Either they can do it with, you know, negotiating with the landowner or basically, you know, suing the landowner and using the state's police power to enter the property. Again, in Oklahoma and I think in a lot of states, it's important to promote this development and they don't want landowners who don't have any mineral and who don't have any interest in the mineral estate to stop this oil and gas production. And then we have um, an agreement with geologists and an agreement with the engineer. And I think, David, yeah. you want to talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, the agreement with the geologist is almost always going to be, uh, as I've said before, uh, him, him or her, the geologist, uh, uh, scientifically deciding which areas, uh, let's say in Oklahoma, uh, might be productive of oil and gas that, that have not been uh, uh, produced or depleted, and so that agreement is, is going to be between the geologist and uh, the uh, operator that he either uh, works for or uh, independently contracts with. That's an agreement that uh, is usually in the form of a letter agreement. It's pretty simple. Uh, geologists uh, typically write them themselves, uh, and uh, the uh, operator or, or the company that uh, wants to uh, explore for the oil and gas pursuant to this glowing report from the geologist might make some changes to it, but they're usually not um, uh, litigated, although I have litigated them in the past, but they're usually not litigated and they're usually not um, uh, prepared by lawyers. Uh, nothing wrong with doing it, but uh, it's pretty standard. Agreements with engineers, like I said in the past, is uh, uh, the engineer isn't really uh, going to need a detailed contract. Um, as a consulting engineer, uh, he will get, if he gets hired by uh, some, uh, if, if, some con if some drilling engineer, petroleum engineer gets hired to uh, be the drilling consultant, he will have a detailed contract uh, with very specific deadlines uh, and uh, obligations and responsibilities. These documents are uh, typically drawn up by lawyers and signed by the drilling consultant with uh, some changes, but oftentimes none. Um, the next uh, uh, slide that we've got here is still timelines considered, and uh, what I want to do is turn this over uh, uh, first to uh, uh, Rhonda to talk about uh, some of these aspects, and then I want, and then Randy's going to talk about it, and then I'm going to go back to the investor participation agreement just briefly. These are just a list of a few of the things that you should or could find when you're doing your record check. Typically, your oil and gas companies are going to have two different landmen. They're going to have their outside landman who's actually going to be out in the county pulling the records, talking with the mineral owners, talking with the surface owners hunting down your heirs that you don't know of, going to other counties and trying to grab probate, um, and doing all of your really running and hardcore um, title examination. Um, another reason to use an outside landman for a lot of this is if you use someone there locally where, where you're drilling your well, a lot of times they have an abundance of information about family history or town history and there's a lot of knowledge that they have that you're not going to find in those records that is going to help you out a lot. 
Um, you're also going to have your in-house landman, and he's the one that's probably going to be you know, showing up to your regulatory hearings. He's going to be possibly neg negotiating with your surface owner. And he's also going to be the, the primary on making your deals with the investor participation agreements that you're going to talk about later, the joint operating agreements, and making sure that everybody who owns um, a working interest or a leasehold interest is all on the same page and getting those agreements and, and things together. When you're checking your records, um, of course you're going to look for oil and gas leases. You're going to look for assignments. Um, those you should always have in your records, and you're going to want to read those very carefully. Um, a couple, we went ahead and threw in a few things here that we don't normally see in the records, but especially if you're representing an oil company, you're going to want to find out if these things exist outside the records. Your joint operating agreements, it's going to tell you, you know, what your agreement is with the other participa participants, especially if it's um, some leasehold that's been held for production since the 70s or 80s. We have units in Oklahoma that have been held since the 30s and 40s. And you're going to want those agreements and find out exactly when you buy this interest what you're buying into and what agreements you're going to be subject to. The same way with your surface of damage agreements, um, a lot of times if you're looking to buy some land, you're going to want to know. You know, not only do a visual inspection for wells, but see if there's any surface damage agreements, if there have been any, any wells on there prior. And also, um, uh, for the first time the other day, I ran into someone had actually recorded their water agreements. Two landowners in two separate sections had cross water agreements that they were using, and they had recorded those. Um, one of the most important things to look at is when you're looking at your oil and gas leases and you're looking at assignments, you've got to pay very, very particular attention to the special provisions in those. Um, Twenty years ago when we all had the producer's 88, if somebody changed something from the standard form, you knew that by the typeface on the front of the instrument, and that's just not the case anymore. These items have to be read word for word now. With word processing, they can go in and change anything. You glance at it, you think it's a producer's 88. They'll even maybe even type producer's 88 at the top to make you think it's a producer's 88. But in reality, um, some of those terms have been changed. Um, mineral owners have become extremely sophisticated in the agreements and the bargaining that they're doing with the oil and gas companies. And as a matter of fact, uh, uh, oil and gas uh, landmen, uh, a lot of oil and gas landmen are women, but uh, they're still landmen. Uh, University of Oklahoma offers a, a degree called Petroleum Land Management. You can get a bachelor's degree in Petroleum Land Management. So it's a, it's a big, uh, important, uh, sophisticated part uh, critical to uh, a successful oil and gas operation to have a good uh, landman because as you can see from what uh, Rhonda told you, uh, if you don't have a good landman that's done your records checking and your and your communication with your uh, mineral owner, you're going to be out of business soon. The investor participation agreement I spoke of before, a lot of times uh, uh, a company will acquire uh, um, an oil and gas lease and, or an assignment of an oil and gas lease and it will get additional investors and instead of getting those, giving those additional investors uh, further assignments of leases, they'll just sell them membership units in the LLC or uh, stock in the corporation. And so they are not, those people who bought working interests, uh, those people who bought the working interests uh, through the LLC or through the uh, corporation are not recorded owners. Only the company is the recorded owner, so they've got an investor participation agreement uh, and they will not show up uh, in the uh, county courthouse. Uh, Randy, tell us a little bit more about uh, some of the leasehold uh, uh, provisions that are important for us. Thanks, David. And like, I'll just follow up on again on what Rhonda said that mineral owners and even surface owners, like what I talked to talked about before, the surface damage agreements, they're getting more and more sophisticated. And a lot of times, there's more and more competition out there, so they use lawyers to negotiate leases to negotiate these things. And as this has happened, you know, the lease form has kind of evolved into something different than than what it was. Because before, you'd have a landman that comes out, you know, sends, sends a lease form out, 
sends a draft for a lease bonus out. The mineral owner would sign it, send, sign it without any changes, sign it without anybody looking at it, send it back, cash the draft, and that would be it. And now, it's, again, it's much more sophisticated. I primarily do um, represent mineral owners and plaintiffs, and they're, you know, anytime they get a lease, they'll come to me and say, hey, what do we think about this, and do you, is there anybody else, is there any competition in the area, What's, what are the lease bonuses going for, and, you know, if you have a general knowledge about that, you can help your clients kind of direct them into the right direction and how to get the best lease form and also how to get the best lease bonus. And, again, I have a lease form that I use, um, and, frankly, it's been evolving for the entire five years I've been practicing law. Um, you know, every time you get something new, you want to put it in. You want to get the best thing. So what basically what, what I would do is I start out with the basic body of the lease form. And generally, I strike the warranty clause because it's my opinion that it's the oil company's job to tell me if I own it or not. And I shouldn't be responsible for their mistakes. So I almost always strike the warranty clause. And some of the general uh, Exhibit A provisions I put in are um, a death clause, which basically states that if any uh, interest below the depth drilled, 100 feet below the depth drilled, is released. And, you know, a lot of people didn't do this in the past, but with different formations and different zones, this can be a real benefit to people, um, to, to the royalty interest owners, because if they drill to a certain formation, three years passes, and no other production is below that, then every, everything below that formation, 100 feet below the deepest formation, is released. And in 10 years, somebody comes in and wants to drill a deeper formation, they actually have to release the property. So these depth clauses have become really popular, and I've actually seen clients who have had them and five years later, they'll get a big lease bonus on the first one, and five years later, a different company will come in and want to drill deeper, and again, they get a new lease bonus and a new lease, which can be a real windfall to them. Um, another big issue uh, recently has been a no deductions clause, and we'll discuss this a little bit later. Um, and basically, the no deductions clause kind of sets out what can and can't be deducted from the cost before the payment to the royalty owner is made. Um, there's some other different clauses that we put in there, but those are the main ones that I like to put in there um, to really give added protection to my mineral interest owner during this lease negotiation. Uh, those are uh, specific express clauses found in oil and gas leases. There are implied covenants in oil and gas leases uh, that are very, very important, and they get litigated a lot, and Randy will be talking about those in, in just a few minutes. Uh, so we've got uh, we've gone through some contracts, and now we're going to go back, like I told you in the beginning, and we're going to talk a little bit about the police power of the state and uh, what what this word spacing and pooling is all about. And Randy, you can address that, can't you? Yes, I can, David. Um, there's a, a regulatory agency in Oklahoma, and again, it's different in every state. I know in Texas it's the Railroad Commission, in Oklahoma it's called the Oklahoma Corporation Commission. That basically all oil and gas drilling and development activity runs through. And basically how you get started with this is you actually have to space something. You want to space a unit. They're usually um, square rectangular units that you space. And you basically go, to, go in front of the commission and say, my geologist says that this unit should be spaced at, say, a 640-acre unit. And once you're spaced at a 640-acre unit and it's approved, everyone within that unit will share proportionally in production of that oil and gas property. It doesn't matter if you're in the southeast quarter and the well is drilled in the northwest quarter. If it's spaced as a unit together, everyone shares proportionally. So that's the first thing that needs to be done before they can actually drill a well. And, and again, to back up just one second, this happens whenever an oil company has taken out leases in the specific, specific section and wants to basically proceed with the drilling activities. Um, and the second thing that happens is, and this is kind of an alien concept to a lot of people, and this is, again, a throw, throw to how David says the state can use their police powers, is that you... Once you space something, and once an oil company has leases, um, has taken out leases from different mineral owners within this specific spaced area, and they basically 
come to the end of the line, no one else will lease to them. They're, so there's still open acreage. There's still unleased acreage within this unit. They can do something called pooling. And so basically what they do is they go in and they give options to the people who are not leased. There's usually four options. There's an option with an eighth royalty and a bonus, um, a three sixteenths royalty, smaller bonus, a quarter royalty, and an even smaller or no bonus, and then the right to pay your cost and participate in the well. Um, and wh how they determine the prices is they testify, their landman testifies in front of the commission of what has been paid in the, it's usually a nine section area. So they don't just look, look specifically at what, what has been paid in that particular spaced unit. They look at the other spaced units around there to try to be fair and to give the people who chose not to lease the best price available. Again, the Commission has done this because they want to be really careful when they use their police powers not to treat people unfairly and not to, you know, try to just um, basically, you know, punish these people for not leasing. And so once it's pooled, you make the election. And so once the election is made, once the period runs for the election to be made, every interest in that space unit is basically either they're pooled or they're leased. So everyone has been made a decision on what percentage they're going to get. And so that's how, once that's done, the oil company can go in, enter that space unit, and then drill the well. Exactly. The deeper the well, uh, the more likely it is that you're going to get 640 acre spacing. The more shallow the well, the more likely it is that you're going to get smaller spacing like uh, even 40 acres. And in some areas in northeastern Oklahoma where you get a 1,500 foot uh, well, you might have uh, 10 acre spacing. Uh, by the way, 640 acres is a square mile. Uh, uh, probably most of you knew that, but uh, in Oklahoma we have these section roads, so you drive a mile, you turn left, you drive a mile, you turn left, you drive a mile, turn left, and now you're back to the original point, and that is one section. That's a typical spacing unit for uh, a deep gas well and more and more for horizontal wells, which are sometimes up to 1,280 acres or two miles long. Uh, so now we've... Uh, <laughs> we've gone through and we've hooked up with our with our uh, mineral owners and we've got uh, our drill pad site located. We've taken care of our surface damages uh, or we're going to court uh, to have the court decide what it is. And, uh, by the way, that uh, pooling order will uh, take the place of, uh, in large measure, the joint operating agreement. Uh, the people who get force pooled won't have a joint operating agreement to sign. They'll have a pooling order that regulates what the operator can and cannot, cannot do, especially if it's those people who are mineral owners who have elected to participate as though they are working interest owners in the property and they decided not to sign a, a lease but decided instead to become forced pooled. So now we're to that point and we're going to go get us a, a drilling rig and uh, I'll uh, just pick a name, uh, Cactus Drilling, uh, Unit Drilling. They own a bunch of drilling rigs, and so uh, they uh, enter into uh, the standard form drilling contracts, uh, and uh, they're um, going to go out there and they're going to start drilling. Um, now, we do have uh, in, that next, in that slide 12, we do have the reference to uh, damages, and and we've talked about the Surface Damages Act, but uh, there will be some possibilities of uh, tort claims that can arise during the course of operations, uh, uh, spillages, uh, saltwater uh, tanks leaking, uh, the pumper uh, uh, doesn't go out there and shut off the pump and the, and the tank overruns and the landman doesn't like it and, or uh, the cattle guard gets filled up with mud and, and cattle run across the cattle guard and get run over uh, or lost or something like that. So you're always going to have typical tort claims. Uh, I'm not going to go into any more detail about that. I just want to make you aware of it. Uh, I think our, uh, our next slide talks about contracts for the sale of the product. So we've produced the oil. It's moving up the production stream. 
uh, it's gone into the tank batteries, uh, and, uh, and, or if you're producing gas, uh, uh, you're getting ready to uh, figure out a way to get this gas to, uh, to market. So uh, you're going to have contracts here, and Rhonda, can you talk to us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, one of the most important things to keep in mind uh, when you get ready to make your contracts to sell your products is to make sure you're following your state's statutory or regulatory rules regarding those sales. Um, obviously, we don't have time in this presentation to do a state-by-state -state overview, but for just for an instance, in Oklahoma we have what's called the Natural Gas Market Sharing Act. Um, and what that is, is the state legislature enacted that in order to give all owners in the unit an equal opportunity to produce and market their share of gas and receive their proceeds. And they put this in to protect um, large owners and small owners from getting different prices to kind of protect the little guy and make sure that when he's producing his gas out of that same well, he's getting the same price, the same rate, and the same deal that everybody else is getting. Um, in Oklahoma, this act is going to, there are some exceptions, but for the most part, it's really going to regulate, you know, who you can sell your gas to, how you sell it, um, how different working interest owners can elect whether they want to sell the gas themselves or whether they want to allow you to sell it. There's provisions regarding arm's length transactions and pretty much everything that you're going to look at in your market sharing and how you're going to negotiate your contracts for your sales of gas are going to be covered um, both by the Act itself and then by the Oklahoma Corporation Commission's rules um, regarding that. Okay. Um, there is lots of uh, litigation uh, uh, in uh, Oklahoma about uh, violations of uh, the uh, Natural Gas Market Sharing Act and whether or not uh, uh, royalty owners are not being paid their market share. Um, uh, but let's go. Let's keep going uh, and uh, and go to our next slide, and then we'll kind of come back to that a little bit. I'll talk about it in a little bit more detail. Um, We've got these bullet points on, on what I've got as slide 14 that starts with collect costs and pay proceeds. Look down at the bottom where it says joint interest billings. Uh, the, uh, the shortened version of that is your JIB, and a joint interest billing or a JIB is the monthly billing that the operator submits to each of the uh, working interest owners who have taken an assignment of an oil and gas lease, uh, let's say they bought a 5% interest in that lease, well they're basically responsible for 5% of all of the costs of drilling and developing and producing this uh, well until uh, it no longer becomes economically feasible. So each month the operator submits to each of the working interest owners uh, a joint interest bill uh, for their pro rata share of the cost of producing for that month. Uh, and that's, uh, that's what a joint interest bill is. It's nothing more than a statement that goes to each of them on their, uh, according to their pro rata interest. Um, we've got the other uh, items uh, listed on here that I'm going to ask uh, uh, Rhonda and then Randy uh, to address. Um, well, first, let's talk about the divisions of interest. Um, in one of our earlier slides, we talked about the division order of analysts being one of your uh, parties in this little act. And what your division order analyst will do is keep track of who gets paid what and who has to pay what. Um, as part of their job, what they're going to do is once proceeds start rolling in and they get ready to start cutting royalty checks, um, in that process, they need to send each royalty owner a division of the interest. And what that's going to be is just a sheet of paper that tells the royalty owner, here's your share in the well. It's going to be the kind of the, a, a supplemental contract between the royalty owner and the oil company as to how those royalties will be paid, how often they're paid. If you have a very small interest, you know, are they going to send you a check every six months? Or are they going to send you a check once it reaches $25? Um, which are a couple of the common provisions. Um, from the mineral owner's side, when you receive that, if, you're not if your mineral owner isn't sophisticated enough to be able to look at that and truly understand the terms, you might want to have an attorney look at it. 
and make sure that they're following the statutory rules of your state on how they're paying and how they're holding your funds. And also to confirm that your division of interest, the actual eight-digit decimal that they're showing on that piece of paper is correct, because many times they're not. Um, the other thing that's going on here is every state has its own separate rules again. And again, we'll talk about Oklahoma, because we have a pretty comprehensive rule. Uh, we have here what's called the Production Revenue Standards Act. And that is a very comprehensive scheme um, that sets out generally how an oil company has to pay their royalty owners um, and what all must be included on the paycheck subs, what did I, you know, some of the costs and things that can be deducted, deducted when those paychecks have, or when those royalty checks have to be issued, how many days you have for first sales, or how long you can keep them in suspense. Um, it's extremely complicated and a lot of very finite detailed rules to help protect the royalty owners. Um, along with that, in Oklahoma, we have what's called middle stat. And that's a case that came down that kind of gave us a broad general overview of what costs you can deduct uh, from your royalty owner's share and what, what items you can help them have them pay their proportionate share of. In Oklahoma, we're, we're what is called a marketable product state, which means as a general rule, Whatever you have to do to that product to make it marketable, to get that purchaser to buy it, that, the cost of all that is going to be borne by the working interest owners um, and their share in their joint interest billing. If you do something additional to that product that enhances the value of the product and the cost is reasonable and you actually see that cost netted in the price that you're receiving for that gas, then you may be able to deduct a portion of that. Uh, but again, you're really going to need a sophisticated, whether you're on the oil and gas side or the mineral owner side of the one, you're going to need a sophisticated attorney who understands all of the ins and outs and details of how you pay, what has to be, re what has to be reflected on your paycheck stubs, and what costs you can and can't deduct. From the royalty owner's share. From the royalty seats. owner's share, exactly. Okay. So the enhanced value that you might be able to uh, let the royalty owner share in is if there is a net appreciable interest in the amount of money that the royalty owner is going to get, you might be able to get the royalty owner to participate with you. Exactly. Okay. Well, we have litigation that comes out of this, don't we, Randy? Yeah, we do. And, and basically litigation, and what we call this is post-production cost cases, it's really exploded in Oklahoma. And over the past, you know, 10 years, there's been multiple lawsuits to try to recoup this cost from the oil companies. And so basically what happens, just like what Rhonda said, is that the oil companies are allowed to deduct certain things from what they, before they pay the royalty owners, and they're not allowed to deduct certain things. And so what, what you have is you have this producing oil well, and, and generally these post-production cost cases are actually natural gas wells. Because oil is pretty um, standard, um, and therefore it doesn't need a lot of things done to it. It just needs to be put in a pipeline and basically shipped to um, a marketing hub. Natural gas is different because natural gas has wide, wide ranges of BTU values. It's some, some gas is wet, which means it has more um, condensate in it. Some gas is dry, which means it doesn't have any condensate in it. So there's a wide variety of natural gas. And this is where this um, post-production cost case has really hit companies and, and frankly, the royalty owners in Oklahoma. Um, you know, there's, there's always the question of, well, you know, some gas comes out of the ground more pressurized than other gas. And maybe you can compress some gas, but you can't compress other gas. And so you get into all these different things. And like Rhonda said, it's, it, it becomes really complicated and really fact intensive to do these post-production cost cases. But one thing that everyone should know is that generally it's hard for one Royalty, royalty interest owner to take on these big companies on cases like this because you have to hire accountants, you have to hire geologists, you have to hire all these high um, price professionals. So generally in Oklahoma what's happened on these post-production cost cases is either they are being certified as class actions or they're just basically mass actions where you get a big group of people together that all goes in and sues the oil company. Um, and again, like Rhonda said, there's just certain things that the case law and the statutes allow these oil companies to do. 
and therefore, and therefore, um, the law is still changing a little bit, so we're still kind of in uncharted territories on some of that stuff. So that's one type of litigation that's really exploded. Another type of litigation that has really exploded is the Im implied duty to develop. And like David was saying before, when, we, when somebody signs an oil and gas lease, and they have an oil and gas lease, they have all these provisions that are actually listed in the oil and gas lease. And then you also have provisions that there's implied covenants. There's an implied covenant to further develop. And so what a lot of plaintiff's lawyers have been doing is that you have a section that's held by an old lease, that there's maybe one vertical producing a well, and you have a lot of activity in that area, but that person who holds the royalty owner's lease doesn't really have to do anything because he doesn't think he has to do anything because the section is held, the, the lease is held by production, and therefore he can just let it go on until produce and produce and produce, and maybe wait for another big company to buy his lease or wait for somebody to propose a well. He thinks he can just wait around. Well, with this implied duty to develop, plaintiff's attorneys and mineral interest owners are going in suing these operators and basically saying that, uh, basically saying that if you don't drill a new well, and usually they demand horizontal wells, which are very, very expensive, and a lot of these little interest owners wouldn't drill a horizontal well anyway. But they go in and they basically say that if you do not drill this well, you need to release our lease so we can release the property to someone else who will drill the well. And again, I think that this is just pretty new. And again, this is another situation that's real fact-based. It's basically the standard is, is what a reasonably prudent operator would do. And, you know, that standard's hard. You know, we can read case law that one judge says this guy was a reasonably prudent operator and this guy wasn't a reasonably prudent operator. And it's hard to differentiate the facts in both of those cases versus the facts in your case. So that's just something that's kind of new, and I think that it's going to continue to be litigated, and, you know, one of these days, one of the courts is really going to have to step in and make a hard and fast rule. Um, and I think those are the two main um, litigation topics that we're seeing a lot of in Oklahoma right now. And I want to go straight to um, water disposal and fracking, because this is another big issue um, with the advent of horizontal um, drilling and then horizontal and fracking. What happens is that not only do you have to pump gallons and gallons and gallons of fresh water, or barrels and barrels and barrels, more, to be more precise, down um, these horizontal holes to pressurize it and frack it, you also have to get that water back out once it starts, starts producing. And then the question is, what do you do with it? And so what companies have been doing are drilling saltwater disposal wells. Basically, they drill a well, and it's not as deep as some of the other, um, some of the other vertical wells that are around, but they, they drill it, and this is regulated by the Oklahoma Corporation Commission. So there's a big cry in rural areas that a lot of people don't like these saltwater disposal wells. They don't like them at all because they're afraid they're going to contaminate the water supply. And Frankly, you know, I'm not saying that that can never happen, but I am saying that it, it is regulated by the Oklahoma Corporation Commission, and there, anybody who drills these are under strict rules and strict guidelines by the way they drill them and the, by the way they um, dispose of salt, so that the salt water. And another issue you have is not only do we have the water that we pump down um, into these horizontal wells, but a lot of these formations that we frack in the shale have a lot of water that's produced from the ground also, and this is the salt water also. And so, you know, you see a lot of these wells in some of these new shale plays, they'll make one barrel of oil at the same time they make one barrel of um, salt water. And so, again, the question is, is how do we continue to dispose of this water? Is there a better way? You know, are there ways that maybe we can recycle this water? Um, and I think those are still questions that are out there. I know there are companies that are trying to do some of this recycling, but at the same time, it's just an, it's a new problem, and they're, I think they're working on new solutions to try to figure it out. Yeah, see, shale is very, very, very tight. It used to be that you couldn't economically drill and produce uh, uh, out of a shale formation because it was so tight you couldn't get the, uh, the oil or gas to flow back into your uh, pipeline because it was just too tight, you couldn't fracture it well enough. But then they came up with this uh, real high pressure, real powerful pumps 
uh, hydraulic fracking and it just splits it open uh, no matter how much it wants to be tight, it's just going to open it up anyway. And when you have a two mile long horizontal well, you're going to be pumping an awful lot of water to frack that open to release that oil and gas that up until uh, the very recent future was stuck in the ground forever. So water's become a big, big issue in uh, oil and gas production. Um, let's move on to the next uh, uh, slide, Randy, and let's talk about uh, shut-ins and, and, uh, and uh, what's allowed, what's the proper payment, things like that. Okay, um, and I'll just briefly hit on this. This is usually a provision um, in most modern leases. It's a shut-in clause. And basically what this shut-in clause does, it allows the oil company at its discretion, or the operator of the well at its discretion, to basically turn off any production that's happening on a well. Um, and there's multiple reasons why they would do this. One of the reasons is just the fact that the prices get depressed, and they, uh, you know, in our law we've decided that they should be able to make the best business decisions for their company. And if they think that natural gas falls to, you know, below a dollar, and they think it's going to go back up, they should be able to turn the well off without losing their lease. And most of these leases or these shut-in provisions are two years. And so, you know, it, it seems like a boon to the oil companies, but at the same time, there's specific procedures that have to be followed. Um, there has to be a nominal payment but it has to be made and it has to be timely. And this basically just kind of puts some responsibility back on the oil companies to say, hey, we intended to do this shut-in. We didn't just turn it off and forget about it and therefore lose our lease. We actually made these shut-in payments that are allowed in the lease um, because, you know what, frankly, for two years we didn't want to sell the gas because th the price was really, really cheap. And so this stuff is allowed. It's just kind of a little um, part of the lease that you know, is pretty standard nowadays, and it's two years. So I think that's okay. about all I have on the shut -in. All right. Well, we've got just a, a couple minutes left. We've, uh, we've drilled this well. We've completed it. We've hooked it up. We've d entered into all our contracts. Everything's been real smooth. We've produced this well. We've produced it and produced it. And now, all of a sudden, it's depleted, and it's time to uh, make a decision, and the operator says, well, working interest owners, this well is no longer producing and paying quantities as you can see from your checks. The checks are about the same of as your joint interest billing, so it's time to plug and abandon the well. And so let's look at our joint operating agreement and see what it says about how we plug and abandon the well. And so you go back and you look at your uh, joint operating agreement and it spells it out what you do and what the costs are and uh, when it's to be done and what your options are if there's a working interest owner that thinks that uh, the uh, well can be uh, reworked. Uh, the working interest owner might propose to the other working interest owners that he's going to take it over. But absent that, what you've got to do is you've got to plug the well and then abandon it. And you do that according to the uh, Oklahoma uh, Corporation Commission rules, which, and they closely regulate that. Uh, and then you've got to uh, uh, restore the surface. Randy, tell us a little bit about what the surface owner is looking for when uh, a well is going to be abandoned and restored. Well, basically what they're going to be looking for is for the surface to be restored as closely to possible as it was before that uh, oil, oil well was drilled. And so basically, even after the, the first agreement with the surface owner, these wells can last for 15 years, but eventually they're going to get the land back. They'll want the company to remove all the equipment, everything from it, you know, remove the gravel that they usually put on the surface, and basically put it back to whatever it was before, just to make like it never happened. But one of the things that's a little bit different in Oklahoma, and that I think is worth mentioning, and I think this is the last thing, but that once a well is abandoned and once a well is plugged, the surface owner actually gains title and owns the borehole, uh, basically, and that's the hole that's drilled into the ground. That's the surface owner owns it down to however many feet it was drilled at, which could be, you know, 10,000 feet. So they own all of it down there, and the mineral owners have nothing to do with it. And this is just worth men mentioning because they can be valuable, and I've seen to where um, saltwater disposal companies come in and want to use that borehole that's already drilled. or oil companies want to come in and re-enter those boreholes. So that's just something that the service owner basically gains out of um, 
the situation when they have a, you know, an oil well drilled on their property. All right. And so I think that's basically all I have. Okay. Um, the uh, that pretty much concludes our uh, our presentation of oil and gas drilling and production revenue. Uh, there are some uh, things that, uh, in closing, I want to encourage everybody uh, to be uh, cognizant of, and that is that these are uh, 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 these uh, oil and gas uh, drilling uh, operations are uh, marketed as uh, opportunities for uh, individuals, uh, and uh, unfortunately, individuals that don't have a great deal of uh, knowledge about. Uh, uh, oil and gas production and what's involved in it, uh, to invest in these and, uh, and sometimes uh, they're not sophisticated investors. And so they're buying uh, securities and the securities are going to be regulated by the state and under certain circumstances by the Securities and Exchange Commission. So you're going to start seeing some uh, litigation over uh, securities violations and uh, uh, boiler boiler room uh, securities offerings. Uh, you're going to be uh, asked by your clients about uh, how to value uh, their minerals and how to value uh, oil and gas leases. Uh, those are uh, questions that uh, uh, reservoir engineers can uh, uh, be helpful uh, in valuing. Even a landman can be helpful in valuing. Uh, and uh, geologists can be uh, helpful in valuing. Also, the marketplace will tell you how these uh, properties uh, uh, get valued. So uh, you're going to be finding uh, valuation questions. Uh, you're going to be finding uh, unsophisticated investors uh, who uh, invested first and asked questions second, and you're going to be finding uh, some securities uh, offerings that don't meet uh, uh, the laws of the state. Um, the only thing that we didn't really cover at all is uh, oil and gas liens, and that's another huge topic. Uh, and maybe we can get into those uh, at another time, or at least uh, in the Meritas uh, presentation. Uh, if anybody wants to ask us any questions at the conclusion, which is now, feel free to do so. Otherwise. Uh, we'll just be signing off at this time. And thanks a lot for uh, joining in. We enjoyed uh, uh, presenting this, and we hope that you got something out of it. Thank you so much, David, Randy, and Rhonda, for sharing all this wonderful information with us. Um, I just wanted to say before we hang up that following this webinar, an email will be sent out to each of you with the presenter's contact information, a copy of their presentation, and a link to the recording as well as a brief survey. So if you have any further questions that weren't addressed during this time, please feel free to reach out directly to David, Randy, or Rhonda. And thanks again. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Please stand by.